Yeah, so I have the unenviable task of summing up everything that's gone before into a series of pithy statements, which I'm not even going to try to do. Uh, what I want to talk about is how I'm, I'm particularly talking to my colleagues within the university right now, how we should think about this, what it takes if you're inside a university uh, to think through what's happening. One of the things I've seen play out over and over again when, when a uh, disruptive force comes in, born in in part on the wings of the internet, whether it's access to content or, or, or distribution, as, as we saw earlier on the slides, a conversation sometimes arises, is this a revolution, yes or no? Revolution, evolution, it's one of those sort of taste great, less filling kinds of arguments. It doesn't really go anywhere because it's conducted almost entirely in linguistic terms, which word applies. Um, I want to try and revive that conversation by using a sociological rather than a linguistic definition. Uh, one I borrowed from Jack Barzun in his, um, his survey of Western thought called From Dawn to Decadence. And in Barzun's telling, a revolution is hap you can you can call a social change a revolution when the members of the relevant society demand things that can't be provided by the existing institutions. The Protestant Reformation was a revolution in, in Barzan's model because the Catholic Church could not both remain itself and provision what was expected of it. Ditto the scientific revolution, ditto the rise of democracy and so on. Once you think of the question in those terms, you really have to ask yourself, who's the society and who are the institutions? Within the universities, we have a habit of regarding all of our participants as being members in good standing. But, but if you take Barzun's logic, then what we're really asking is, are students and employers, or will students and employers, demand things that current universities and colleges are unable to provide? We know that the answer to that question will be yes in at least some cases. We don't have to go much beyond that to start thinking about it. But that, I think, becomes, uh, becomes a way to frame the question about change. So I, much of what I want to talk about is basically a giant footnote to Albert's observations about unbundling. And I want to talk about, two, I want to tell two stories of unbundling mm -hmm. and talk about the difference between flattering unbundling and unflattering unbundling. So flattering unbundling, from within the university, flattering unbundling looks like somebody basically copying us. So even as we can get our backs up about competition, no one's attacking the idea of our structure. So flattering unbundling is Georgia Tech's $6,600 MS degree. It's a degree. It's offered by a college. You take classes. You get a certificate. It's cheaper than we are. But it flatters every other assumption we have about ourselves. Here's what unflattering unbundling looks like. There's a guy downtown, Joel Spolsky, Spolsky runs a software company, uh, decided because the software that they had deployed called Stack Exchange, which is a remarkable set of structured question answering sites, was generating so much data with so much value that he said, we got to hire some machine learning people. We're, got, we're not going to be able to survive as a company if we can't extract the value of this data. And try to hire machine learning people in a city where Wall Street is also hiring machine learning people. So Spolsky tries, he has, he has interviews, and either the price tag is up here or the quality is down there. And then he says, you know what? I already have programmers that I like, that like this company. Why don't I just train them in machine learning? And so he gave his own programmers afternoons in which their work was take a MOOC on machine learning. That's what unflattering unbundling looks like. There's no degree. There's no certification because what Joel cares about is not do you have a degree in machine learning. He cares about can you do the job. And something that inverts the hiring from the education is so unfamiliar to us, we almost don't recognize that as a threat. And yet, over and over again, the threats that come from these kinds of these kinds of changes come from the stuff that is unrecognizably different from what's gone before. Another example of the same thing, flattering, flattering unbundling is JSTOR, right? Take the idea of a journal, keep absolutely everything except the paper, right? Get rid of the underlying paper, store it in an online database. JSTOR's principal expense is security, right? In order, the extra cost of making mm -hmm. 
digital data as inconvenient as paper is now the majority of what goes into maintaining j electronic journal access. If you've ever tried to get anything out of Bobst off of the campus and had to go through the proxy servers and so forth, you will see how much work goes into making uh, electronic data inconvenient, inconvenient enough that it's recognizably the same model of the scientific journal that we've been used to since the 1660s. Here's the unflattering unbundling. And it's, yeah, I think Albert also uh, uh, referred to this, it's, um, it's polymath. So uh, uh, about four years ago now, Tim Gowers, a fields level mathematician, put up a post on his blog called Is Massively Collaborative Mathematics Possible? It's one of the seminal posts in academic thought. Uh, if you want to see how academics are using the internet as if it really exists and is not just a cheap Xerox machine, that, that post is a turning point. And he says, could you have dozens or even hundreds of mathematicians throwing together scrap ideas, things that they even think are wrong, but are maybe relevant? So they try this, and they do a few of these things. And then up comes Polymath 4, it's a uh, search for prime numbers, and they, man they, they, they in fact discover a new source of prime number funding. They submit it to the Journal of Mathematics of Computation, the journal accepts it. Then they send it back and they said, you forgot to tell us who the author was. And there's a little post on Polymath that said, okay, now we have to go through the whole rigmarole of pretending that there's an author because they won't accept it if we tell them how we really did this. Right? So think about the, f the form of a journal. A journal used to be a way of increasing the size of the audience and accelerating the spread of knowledge through the academy. Traditional journals are now ways of decreasing the size of the audience and slowing down the spread of knowledge through the academy. Meanwhile, at Polymath or, or on, um, uh, for the search for the P does not equal NP problem in computer science, which is another example in the field of mathematics, the mathematicians are gathering on blogs and wikis. They're not even going to anything that looks like traditional infrastructure. All of the relevant people are already represented. It is, it is demonstrably within the mission statement of academic work. It also doesn't look like anything we're used to. So one of the curiosities of institutions that manage complicated bundles is the less sense the bundle makes, the likelier the institution is to regard the bundle as sacred and to inculcate its employees into believing that it is sacred, right? Hmm. You go over here <coughs> to Gray's Papaya, nobody is arguing to those employees that hot dogs and mustard are a good bundle. If that bundle went away today, it would be invented again tomorrow. If the university went away, went away today, no one tomorrow would say, hey, you know what we need? And make something that looks exactly like this, right? People make arguments about the sacredness of social relations when those relations wouldn't be reinvented if they didn't exist. But that's exactly the thing that makes it difficult for us to think through what's going on. So in many ways, the, to the provocation of this panel, what does the university of the future look like? The answer is going to be, it's not going to look like a university. Right? It's the stuff where the relationship between the students and the employers doesn't go in either the traditional order or uses the existing models of, uh, use, use the existing models of management that we have. So I'll end with a provocation, which is if you think about our metadata, if you think about our stock keeping units inside the university, there are seven big ones. Class, course, grade, credit, degree, department, major. We have lots of others. We have semesters and GPA and all the rest of it. But those are the big seven. Not one of them is real. They're all pretend. They're all just how we do it around here. Here's what's real. Students are real. Knowing things is real. Being able to do things is real. And the people who can find alternate ways to get at those things without going through our stock keeping units, class, course, degree, major, et cetera, that's, that's where the really disruptive stuff comes from. It's not the people who are building a university except it's online. It's the people who are saying students learning things and working doesn't have to be done at all like we've done it before. That's where the surprises are going to come from.